chapter 30. Uh, chapter 30 is another kind of miscellany chapter uh, that covers some of the additional less emergent situations that we run into. Um, they can all kind of play into many of the calls that we get, but uh, just have a lower acuity than most of uh, what we're, we're used to in EMS. Um, so we're going to talk about the disorders of the eye, ear, nose, throat, and oral cavity. Um, as with all the chapters, simply reading and listening to the lecture is no replacement to actually reading and studying the text. We continue with the theme of the AEMT will be able to apply the fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on the assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. A couple of uh, objectives on 702 and 703. So AEMTs must have a basic understanding of the disorders that affect eyes, ears, nose, oral cavity, and throat. Often this gets abbreviated as EENT -E or HEENT. Um, HEENT would be head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. Uh, or EENT is eyes, ears, nose, throat. Um, those uh, typically, most of those are, are uh, taken care of by a uh, otorhinolaryngologist uh, and an ophthalmologist. So that would be the, the major uh, specialties that, that work with these sorts of issues. And the threat of the loss of any of those senses is very frightening for patients. And sometimes it is a, a short-term issue while others um, it's a progressive or a permanent issue. All right, so to uh, recall a little bit here some of the anatomy and physiology of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, and throat. We look here at the anatomy of the eye. Uh, remember that the eye has uh, a lot of very specialized nerve cells in it. It's controlled by several muscles. Um, either side of the eye and the top and the bottom. Um, it's very vascular as well. However, it's generally a hollowed out orb with the uh, clear lens. Uh, over the top of the, the lens is uh, the uh, uh, sclera, and, or not the sclera, the uh, conjunctiva is the, uh, the white part. Uh, and then we have uh, the cornea being the uh, clear part over the middle of the eye. Uh, li eye uh, the light then passes through the pupil of the eye, uh, which is surrounded by the iris, which is the colored part, focuses through the lens, and then focuses on the fovea uh, in the back of the eye, which is the point in which um, the light and the image are supposed to focus on. Um, of course, we've got a lot of uh, ancillary parts and pieces here where we have some of the orbital fat. You have the optic nerve, which comes off the back, which feeds the, uh, the message back to the brain. Uh, we have uh, the retina being the parts of the eye that kind of absorb different colors um, and different types of, of images. And then, of course, you've got the bony orbits of the eye. You have the, the eyelids that uh, cover the eye and protect it. So the eyes give us vision, of course, uh, provided by the various receptor cells in the eye. We have the bony orbits, uh, which are the skull, and those accessory structures such as the lids and the lashes, the tear ducts, as well as the eyebrows, which all protect the eye. So. The eyelids uh, help to uh, bathe the eye and then give it a, a, an armor. Uh, the eyelashes uh, help to, uh, to give it a, a bumper, basically, and some additional protection. And the tear glands will constantly uh, wash the eyes uh, and uh, create um, tears that uh, will then run into, uh, usually from the outside towards the inside of the eye, to help um, bathe uh, any dust and, and debris off. And again, a hollow globe filled with uh, two fluid-filled chambers. So if we back up a second and look at that, the anterior chamber of the eye is everything in front of 
the lens. The posterior chamber is everything behind the lens. So the anterior chamber, um, we have aqueous humor, and in the posterior chamber, we have vitreous humor. And uh, the various humors help to, uh, uh, as a part of uh, the focusing process as well. I'll know that when we, if you would like fill a glass with water um, and you look through it, it distorts the view. So with a certain amount of fluid in there is what our eye gets used to seeing and what used to be there. So as we change those amounts of fluid in there, particularly the pressures in there, uh, it can distort the vision. And that's exactly what glaucoma is, is an increase in those fluids in there that causes uh, some distortion of that vision. So the vitreous humor is also responsible for giving the eye much of its, we'll, we'll say, not as much as shape, but its uh, um, its structure in a, in a, in a sense, um, its integrity. Because uh, when you, um, I'll, I'll give you a good example. When I used to assist with postmortem uh, exams uh, with our medical examiner we would frequently draw vitreous humor off of the eyeball. Um, and uh, if, as long as you take a cc or so of, of vitreous humor off the eyeball, you're generally going to be all right. You take a little too much vitreous off there, and it takes your eye from the shape of a grape and turns it into a raisin. So uh, you can test the vitreous humor for the, the presence of uh, many different substances and drugs. So that would be a reason why they would do that. But So we'd take a needle and stick it in from the corner of the eye and draw a little humor off there. But it gave, it, it was the filler, the clear filler, uh, that gave the eye its, its orbit, orb shape, or it's uh, actually kind of a grape-like shape. We have the fibrous layer of the eye, which is the sclera and the cornea, clear cornea, which covers, uh, is basically the first clear membrane. We have the vascular layer, uh, which uh, includes the circular and pigmented iris. Uh, and this is also the layer in which uh, the vessels uh, are within that uh, are reaching into the retina as well. And uh, the retina is the neural layer or the nerve cells are there. They, uh, um, it's a basically an outgrowth of the brain. It's connected to the brain's visual centers through the optic nerves. We have rods that are very light sensitive but not color sensitive, and the cones, which are the color sensitive uh, cells in the eyes. Remember that the pupil um, changes size, and uh, that's usually to accommodate light. However, parasympathetic um, nervous system and sympathetic nervous system also will play uh, on what the eye does. So with the, uh, uh, the sympathetic stimulation, Typically, we'll get some some pupil um, constriction that will allow us to focus in a little better, or we'll get some parasympathetic relaxation and dilation, which is typical um, of, at night um, as we're sleeping. <laughs> the ear. So within the anatomy of the ear, we've got numerous uh, important parts in here. We have everything that's on the outside, which is what we commonly think of. But we've got uh, the helix and the antihelix, which are really the major, we'll say, funnel into the ear. Uh, there's some cartilage within that. Um, we have the external auditory meatus, which is the external opening. We have the lobe of the ear, um, as well as just inside the lobe of the ear. There's the mastoid process, which is a bony prominence uh, right behind it and the concha, which is the bowl which feeds this uh, sound in. And that's really what all that external part is, is it's a funnel for sound. Funnels that sound into the external auditory meatus where it gets down to it, where it comes in contact with the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, which is kind of encased within the bony structures. Of course, there's nerves and arteries and vessels and everything that run very close by. Um, and then just inside the tympanic membrane, we have the three uh, bones, the three ossicles of the ear. Um, collectively, both ears have the six smallest bones in the body. 
uh, in them where we have the Incus and the Malleus um, and where do we oh and the stapes there it is it's over on the on the right side so the Incus the Malleus and the stapes or the anvil the hammer and the stirrup um, they are mainly responsible for conducting sound um, and they'll conduct the sound then into our inner ear um, from the middle ear to the inner ear and the inner ear is where we have things such as the semicircular canals which are uh, responsible for equilibrium um, we have a canal that basically goes side to side front to back and then diagonally um, and it's with those canals are what helps to give us our sense of balance um, we also have within the ear you have uh, the cochlea and the cochlea is kind of a, a ram's horn or a snail shell shape uh, that helps to uh, funnel that sense of hearing down. Uh, we have the uh, auditory nerves which will help uh, transmit the sound in for interpretation. And then coming out of that middle ear um, down into the nose you have the eustachian tube. Um, so if you've ever blown your nose and your ear filled up that's why that filled up um, because you blew some some snot backwards up your eustachian tube. Um, in the pediatric, the very, very young pediatric population, the infant population, um, they tend to be a little more prone to ear, drum, or ear infections because that eustachian tube is much more horizontal, whereas in the adult or the older, older patient, it's more uh, diagonal. So within that inner ear, we have things that the actual hearing process and equilibrium uh, is, is what we get out of the, that inner ear part. Um, our equilibrium a lot has to do with uh, some of the, we've mentioned before, there's some hair cells in there and on top of those hair cells there are things called otoliths and those otoliths are kind of a weight that as we change position those rock back and forth on those little hairs and those, uh, that helps us to determine where our position in space is. Um, people will develop otitis media from having an inner ear or actually a middle ear infection. Uh, that otitis media is the most common uh, ear infection that we hear about. Uh, there's not a lot of otitis externa. Uh, for the most part it's a pretty self-cleaning uh, device externally on the outside of the eardrum because that's where we have we develop cerumen or earwax um, and that earwax is a combination of both our uh, uh, secretions that are supposed to help clean and, and wash the ear, some of our body oils, and then some of the dirts and things that get in there. Um, and so it's generally self-cleaning and for the most part moves itself out. Once in a while people will get a little Im impaction in there um, and that impaction uh, can either be uh, removed manually or sometimes removed chemically. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people uh, get put a little peroxide down in the ear, kind of bubbles some of that crap out of there. But uh, you can also get mastoiditis. Uh, in mastoiditis, you have uh, an infection uh, in the air cells and some of the, uh, the, the trapped uh, parts uh, of the ear and that uh, affects those, uh, uh, that basically inner ear area that causes usually some problems with equilibrium. Uh, the pinnae uh, is the outer ear, and like I said, that helps to funnel the sound wave into the, uh, the inner ear. Cerumen, uh, that's the ear wax, so that helps protect our, our ear canal from foreign bodies. Uh, you also have the hairs within there that try to help uh, act as a little filter. The tympanic membrane is the ear drum, and that's what separates the auditory canal from the middle ear. It's uh, aptly named because that ear drum uh, conducts sounds just like the, uh, uh, you know, the the surface you strike on a drum, which uh, the skin, I guess, of the drum, that uh, it, it, you strike that and it conducts the uh, the sound in then to the uh, body of the drum. Uh, that middle ear is filled with air and it communicates with, uh, with the nasal pharynx by way of that auditory tube uh, or the eustachian tube. Uh, 
um, and then we have um, that allows for the equalization of pressure between the middle ear and the atmosphere. So when you maybe take a flight and you're told to plug your nose and and uh, kind of breathe uh, forcefully against it, uh, it's in theory going to allow a little bit of excess pressure to um, equalize out. Uh, and that's where you kind of get some of that popping of the eardrums from. All right, the auditory cortex. So we're talking the, the most inner parts there uh, feed into the brain uh, and permits recognition interpretation of sounds and damage that auditory cortex impairs the ability to understand or make sense of, of certain sounds. So people who will potentially get nerve deafness, uh, you can have nerve deafness from uh, damaging uh, the nerves in, in the cortex there, whereas you can also have structural deafness where that occurs from um, you know, problems with the the uh, ossicles there, the eardrum, um, or the things prior to getting to the auditory nerves. The nose. Um, the nose is, uh, in, in addition to its uh, respiratory function, of warming, humidifying, and filtering air is obviously also our uh, organ of the sense of smell um, or olfaction. Um, so it helps us to pick up small molecules uh, that, of odorants that are in the air. And uh, of course, due to uh, um, our memories, many times we can uh, identify things due to their sense of smell. Um, the these little particles will be brought into the nose, picked up by many of the little uh, nerve cells that come down through the cribriform plate, um, in which it doesn't do a, a very good job here showing that one. So I'm going to take this and highlight right here is the cribriform plate. Uh, and that cribriform plate uh, there's lots of little itty bitty nerves that come through there and they'll all kind of come down through here. It's a little perforated disc. Okay, and this is where uh, these little nerve sensors almost have little buds on them uh, that will pick up uh, some of these molecules that have been suspended in, in uh, now liquid as, as the mucus from the nose kind of grabs onto these. Um, and then th that's the little buds that start to kind of interpret um, those sorts of things. Oh, back to normal. I guess we could kind of clear that. Great. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so the respiratory functions, um, warming, humidifying, filtering air, also helps us with our sense of smell. Um, and then uh, they're transmitted into the CNS uh, to the olfactory nerve. Um, the cranial nerves that have to do with your sense of smell are cranial nerve number one. If you remember way back when we were talking about some of the structure of the brain, talked about the 12 pairs of cranial nerves, many times during uh, the process of assessment, people will say cranial nerves 2 through 12 are, are grossly intact. Um, and they often leave out cranial nerve number one. Well, part of the problem with that is we don't always have something that's easy for them to identify a sense of smell. Um, so that, remember, cranial nerve number one is your sense of smell. And then those nerves transmit, uh, nerve transmission stimulate the hypothalamus and the limbic system to kind of have a reaction to it. So, you know, obviously some things smell very good to us, maybe a, a cup of coffee or fresh cut grass, um, and while other things, um, many cases which we have to deal with an EMS, maybe not so much. And then the oral cavity, uh, obviously part of the airway and digestive system. Remember that the pharynx is kind of the shared zone for both of those. Um, it has a digestive function, uh, the sense of taste. We have a mechanical breakdown of food. We have a chemical breakdown of food that then occurs with the salivary amylase. 
It's composed of obviously numerous uh, parts and pieces there between the lips, the cheeks, uh, the palate, gums, teeth. Remember, have uh, taste buds on the tongue. They're kind of in different zones. Um, there's you know certain parts of the tongue that, that sense sweet, while other parts of the tongue that sense um, salty, and some t taste uh, bitter, while some some taste sour. And then there's also a part of the tongue that tastes um, umami, and umami is basically savory. Um, they uh, they liken that to uh, the taste of MSG. Also within uh, our oral cavity, of course, we have our teeth, uh, and uh, we have 20 primary or baby teeth, which are eventually replaced by 32 secondary teeth. Um, most adults probably have 28 secondary teeth, because in many cases, um, the, the four third molars um, are removed, uh, because those are the wisdom teeth. Um, and, and it all kind of depends. Um, some people actually um, have genetically don't grow a third set of molars uh, because it's been determined we no longer use those much. Many people don't have room for them in their mouth, and that's why they end up getting removed. But there are a few people that uh, that they have a large enough mouth that they actually can uh, can hold their third molar. Some people they never even have them erupt, so they never come through. Uh, these teeth, we have an enamel covering uh, over the crown and the neck of the tooth, and it uh, extends to um, uh, below or above the uh, the gum line, depending on which uh, jaw you're talking about. And then you have the root section, uh, which extends into the bone of the jaw. Uh, the tooth itself also has an, a, a living sensory uh, neurovascular uh, pulp of the tooth. Um, anybody who has uh, ended up having to have a root canal uh, can uh, appreciate that uh, it's not particularly a, a fun uh, occasion because of uh, all the, the nerves and the blood vessels within the tooth um, are essentially uh, drilled and filed out. Um, and uh, it leaves the casing of the tooth there, and that casing then gets filled in with a, you know, some sort of a, a resin or, or a... Uh, epoxy that goes in there and helps the tooth uh, maintain its structure. So we can here look and see several of the components of the oral cavity. The teeth, we have the upper hard palate, the lips, gums, tongue. We have uh, some tonsils that are located in here towards the back of the tongue. Some of them actually in the back of the nasal cavity. Um, That's the three major tonsils, the pharyngeal tonsil really at the back of the nasal cavity, the palatine tonsil um, um, on the sides of the mouth towards the back of the tongue, the lingual tonsil which is actually at the base of the tongue where it comes into contact with the epiglottis. Um, we also have uh, a couple of other uh, structures that uh, don't get discussed often, but the frenulum. Uh, the frenulum is that little narrow band of tissue uh, that attaches the lip uh, to the gums, um, and it's you know basically between your two front teeth on the top and two front teeth on the bottom. You have a frenulum there. You have a, a, a frenum or a septum beneath your tongue, which kind of does the same thing, holds it in place. The but below the uh, the layer of the enamel is the dentin part of the tooth, um, and that's where you kind of have some microtubules that communicate with the pulp cavity, kind of give some innervation. If you have um, very sensitive teeth, you probably have some thin thin um, enamel, and then you have larger uh, pores, micropores in your dentin that allow for that sense of of cold or heat uh, to get into the, uh, the middle parts of the tooth. And then your teeth are anchored into the bone uh, with something called uh, cementum, which are kind of like little ligaments that hold the, uh, the tooth in place. So And throat. 
We have three major regions of the throat, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the hypopharynx. Um, we have the three sets of, of tonsils, which I previously mentioned, so I don't think we need to dive much into those. We should be well aware of the nasal, oro, and hypopharynx. All right, so we have a number of medical specialties that are devoted to these various functions, whether we're talking things such as the eyes, which are typically ophthalmologists. Uh, those are physicians that treat eyes. Optometrists, a doctor of optometry, is really one that concentrates on vision and correction of vision, whereas ophthalmology do, does uh, surgical interventions um, to uh, correct problems with the eyes. So um, they're the ones that are more likely to deal with things such as um, cataracts and detached retinas and macular degeneration and so on and so forth. Where the optometrist, you go in, you have your vision test done, they maybe do some minor medications and, and, and issue you some corrective lenses. Um, ears, nose, uh, and throat, that's the otorhinolaryngologist. Uh, that deals with those those areas of the, the body. Uh, the oral cavity, of course, we have the specialty uh, of dentistry that deals with that, doctor of dentistry, doctor of dental science, orthodontia, oral surgeons, um, all which kind of play around uh, with the, mostly the teeth. Um, in an emergency, patients really don't have access to most of those specialties. So some of those specialties um, if, if people are thinking about going into uh, uh, medicine and becoming a physician, uh, these would be some of the specialties that uh, you would have the least likelihood of getting called in in the middle of the night to go and deal with uh, a some sort of issue like that. Um, dermatology would be another one. Uh, you're just not going to have a lot of emergency calls at 3 o'clock in the morning to go in and deal with somebody who's you know, got a, a rash or somebody who's got you know a, a sore throat. Um, so many times they do require prompt care. The problem with many of these things is it directly uh, either has to do with a nervous system issue or it has to do with an airway issue. So uh, they do have some concerns that we're, we're going to deal with. Complaints will be very diverse, things such as pain, swelling, loss of function. Some of them that are showing loss of function are kind of a big deal. So you lose sense of sight. Um, that, that becomes a pretty big emergency. Um, dizziness, headaches, nausea, vomiting, fever, infection, fever, malaise. I mean, it's a lot of, again, like we talked about in the preceding chapter, a lot of nonspecific signs and symptoms. Um, but it gets distressing when people lose something that they take for granted. You know, you lose your sight or you lose part of your sight. There are different disorders in which, you know, you can see out of, uh, you can see out of a, a only half of your eyeball. So maybe you can see everything left of center, but you can't see anything right of center. Um, there's all kinds of really odd, weird things that can pop up that uh, lead people to be a little, little concerned. Swelling in some of these areas leads to airway obstruction. So they can also have pain. So analgesia may or may not be appropriate. You may consider a little nitrous oxide. Um, and then use your assessment to kind of drive your questioning. So be particularly concerned with the airway of patients with complaints of oral cavity problems. So I've got swelling in my tonsils. Okay, well, is it a truly affecting your airway? And that's something that we have to look at the patient individually and say, okay, is this truly uh, leading to something that uh, is particularly an, an airway, uh, potential airway obstruction? Severe cases, advanced airway management might be necessary. Uh, luckily, uh, for many of these, um, it's a fairly slow moving process. So to talk a little about the eyes, uh, we have a, a number of things that uh, pop up, uh, very uh, typically minor, but uh, we have things like conjunctivitis. Uh, conjunctivitis is an inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eye. Uh, it's commonly called pink eye. Is it that pink or red bloodshot appearance? In many cases, uh, it can either be something as far as an allergy. It could be an infection. Sometimes it's just um, from, say, foreign bodies. Maybe dust has gotten in there. 
and uh, has now irritated the eye. Uh, you can have a bacterial conjunctivitis, which is going to start to then create some exudate or some pus, um, and it may crust the eyelids. You can get eyelids that kind of crust shut. Of course, the easiest thing to do with that, anybody who's been a parent uh, longer than, than a couple of years has had to deal with this. A little warm, uh, warm wet washcloth on the eye helps kind of break that up a little bit and allows the eye to get open back up again. Um, so you're going to want to be careful when you're dealing with the eye at any time um, because it is so absorbent and it has so uh, it's so good at picking up any sort of substances. So being very careful that we we take clean gloves and use uh, extreme precautions. Um, now don't forget that um, you have been cleaning, working on their eyes. You reach up and you kind of maybe scratch or itch your eye not even thinking twice about it, you may have just given yourself uh, conjunctivitis. A hordeolum or a sty, uh, that's a very, very common term we hear, uh, but this is when one of the ducts, the ocular ducts, um, gets blocked. So it can't secrete the um, uh, tears and uh, the typical culprit is a staph infection, a minor staph infection. Uh, usually it is also treated with warm wet complexes or complex compresses uh, to help try to promote drainage to soften up things and allow uh, a little bit more blood flow in there. Occasionally people end up on an antibiotic, but for the most part, other than being more of a uh, more of a visual distraction and or a uh, not so fashionable statement that you can make. Uh, it is uh, generally self-limiting and will, will kind of uh, fix itself in the long run. Uh, and then when a hordulum results in the accumulation of a granular tissue, you can uh, develop a, a chronic condition called a chalazion. Uh, and that chalazion is uh, kind of a more or less a little uh, cyst in there. We can also have orbital and periorbital cellulitis, just like we can get cellulitis in, in our legs, in our hands, in our arms, wherever. Um, it, can be, it can be a serious bacterial infection in tissues around the eye. It can affect the eye itself, not just the lids. Uh, so um, it can be a complication of a sinus infection, maybe some, some sort of an injury, an, an insect bite. Um, Maybe you got uh, got some foreign bodies, maybe some some glass in the eye that could potentially cause um, an opening for some infection in there. Um, it typically will be very swollen, and uh, there could be signs of of a infection such as a fever or headache. Um, the orbital cellulitis uh, is deeper and far more serious, so uh, it's it's deeper into the into the system. It can cause some destruction of the bony structures around the eye. Foreign bodies. Foreign bodies will get in and just simply irritate the cornea and conjunctiva. So it kind of more or less gives you a, a um, conjunctiva or conjunctivitis. You can also get a foreign object that gets in the eye and causes uh, a, uh, a corneal abrasion in which it actually goes in there and and scratches uh, the corneal layer. Um, do not attempt to remove embedded objects in the globe of the eye. If it's something that you can easily rinse with a little bit of saline, uh, by all means try to remove it, particularly if it's a, a, a chemical. Um, but um, if you've got something that's actually stuck there, um, leave it alone and uh, you know cover both the eyes and transport them in. Uh, for the uh, the doc to remove it, they'll use various various methods, things called slit lamps and magnifying glasses, and um, some uh, dyes where they'll dye the color of the eye. They'll dye it kind of an orangey color, and then they'll look at it under a blue light, and it shows them where where the actual damage on the the, the globe is. Glaucoma, uh, glaucoma is a vision threatening condition. Uh, that results uh, sometimes when EMS will get called because of severe eye pain or loss of vision. Um, glaucoma, like I mentioned earlier, is an increase in intraocular pressure. 
our eyes typically have some drains built into them that will allow uh, for the excess fluids to drain off. Uh, it doesn't, uh, sometimes the, uh, these little canals or these little drains get blocked and it causes this buildup. So uh, those are typically called the, uh, those are called the canals of Schlem, but uh, it's kind of a funny name, but the, uh, that allows that excess pressure to just to get off of there as needed. Uh, with that increasing pressure on the eye, it's basically like, um, you know, I'm not I'm not advocating this, but if you close your eye and you press on your eye a little bit, you typically start to see a little color on that eye that you're pressing on because you've increased the pressure in there a little bit. That's the same sort of thing that's a, a constant with glaucoma. It's that excessive amounts of pressure in the eye there. It's it's actually putting extra pressure on the nerves, and those nerves are starting. Um, to uh, to buckle to some of that pressure, and eventually they they uh, start to uh, die out. Um, <clears throat> so we get this increased pressure transmitted into the posterior chamber. Per it, glaucoma is typically fairly progressive. Um, however, there's uh, uh, in many cases patients can be put on medication, and it does a pretty good job of of uh, keeping things at bay um, with uh, in certain occasions, patients will have uh, a sudden spike in their interocular pressure. Certain medications or certain procedures that we do, such as um, placing an airway, can cause spikes in the pressure. Um, it's going to result in eye pain, uh, visual disturbances, potentially headaches, and then uh, sudden partial um, or total loss of vision uh, in, in the eyes can be um, fairly serious. There can be examples of it, uh, an occlusion of the retinal artery, so basically a blood clot in your retinal artery, a detached retina where part of the nervous tissue of the back of the eye is coming off uh, or uh, is basically going offline. Sometimes it's from things like tumors. Um, you can also have uh, migraines that will affect the vision. Usually doesn't result in vision loss, but um, and so there's there's a lot of potentials uh, that can cause us to lose some vision in one or both eyes or in just part of the field. So remember, uh, if we have that impaled object in the eye, cover both eyes, pad around whatever's in the eyes. Remember, it's got to be both eyes because the eyes typically move in tandem. And uh, if we don't uh, take them both offline, one's going to continue to look around and it's going to cause damage to the other. All right, now we move on to the ear. Uh, otitis externa, otitis media, labyrinthitis. Uh, otitis externa, it's just an inflammation or an infection of the external auditory canal. Pretty uncommon, um, and in most cases, simply just needs the ear canal to be cleaned out a little bit. Perhaps there's something from a little bit of trauma, or there's a, a foreign object in the ear. Uh, Sadly enough, in many cases, it happens to be insects, um, whether or not that's from you know being outside or being from a house that's maybe not so uh, hygienic. Um, usually, they complain of things like ear pain or fullness and hearing loss, um, and in most cases, uh, it's a it's a quick cleanup, and uh, and it's maybe some eardrops, and for the most part fairly self-limiting. Otitis media, however, is very common, particularly in small children, where we've developed now an infection and an inflammation behind the middle ear, behind the eardrum. Usually it's a, a, an obstruction of the eustachian tube or something backing up the eustachian tube that causes this. Um, in, the, in the young, young patients, they'll often end up with a, a tube in the ear which allows for drainage. They go in and actually cut a little window in the uh, eardrum, and that allows for um, that extra fluids to, to drain off of there. Patients will complain of fullness in their ear, uh, increased pressure in the ear, pain behind that eardrum, um, drainage from the ear occasionally. Uh, in many cases in older patients, 
Uh, other things we have to be concerned with is they're a little bit more active. They may actually puncture their eardrum um, or uh, rupture the eardrum. And uh, it's, it's not terribly uncommon. It usually heals on its own. Sometimes we'll get a little bleeding from it, uh, but it depends a lot on the um, extent of how badly it's damaged. Labyrinthitis. Uh, this is the inflammation of the inner ear, uh, usually from a viral or bacterial source uh, or some other uh, inflammatory process. In many cases, um, it is uh, biggest. The biggest thing that uh, we see from it is vertigo, uh, and then associated nausea and vomiting. Where some of the inner parts of the ear that help control our equilibrium. Um, are the parts that are kind of uh, under fire, and so then it makes us very, very dizzy. Um, you may also have Meniere's disease and Meniere's syndrome. Uh, these increase pressure uh, that disrupt the mechano, uh, mechanoreceptors of the inner ear and, again, causes balance and vertigo issues. So um, Meniere's comes from increased pressures, uh, whereas labyrinthitis is from inflammations and in many cases um, from uh, infections. Um, you may also exper experience something called tinnitus, which is a ringing or roaring in the ears, uh, something that I myself have uh, been able to uh, live with for the last 20 some odd years, uh, if not more, uh, constant ringing in my left ear. Um, now that I'm, I'm talking about it, of course, it's going to bug the hell out of me for a while, but uh, for the most part, I've learned to ignore it. Um, not all vertigo is caused by labyrinthitis or Meniere's disease. Sometimes it's things such as blood pressure, head injuries, um, maybe you have another illness that's kind of um, got your body under fire a little bit. Medications can do that. Strokes could potentially do that as well, though. Uh, the foreign body in the ear, I kind of mentioned that. Um, that a lot of times we see things such as insects, cockroaches, um, it's, it's lovely. Can get in there and then just can't back themselves out. Um, you know, there's always people putting different oddball things in their ears. People um, putting seeds and peas and whatever in their ear. Um, don't ask why. I don't know. Some people think that that's just cool. Uh, we typically are not going to try to remove foreign objects from the ear in the pre-hospital setting. Um, it, it's it's kind of a delicate place to be. So if we have um, you know, something stuck in an ear canal, who knows how far down it goes. If we press on it a little more, we could puncture the eardrum. So it's something that uh, we may want to save that for the physicians to take care of. Um, new onset hearing loss. Uh, if we were talking about uh, somebody who previously had pretty decent hearing or has had a sudden change, ear infections inner ear disturbance, exposure to loud noise. Anybody who's been, been to a, a uh, rock music uh, concert can attest to that. Uh, also, somebody who uh, has been standing in front of the ambulance when somebody thought it would be cute to uh, crank the siren on. Um, <clears throat> ruptured tympanic membrane, because that we've lost some of the uh, ability to conduct sound. Uh, serum and impaction, so lots and lots of earwax. Uh, foreign bodies in the ear, blows to the head. Also sometimes certain medications uh, can be ototoxic, which they will take an effect on the ear and uh, um, make it so you have some temporary hearing loss. All right, we talked about tubes in the ears. So we can kind of skip through this. We got the small plastic tube that allows air movement uh, and allows to uh, um, drain. Don't get a kind of a suction in there that a lot that keeps the fluid from from backing down the AU station tubes. Moving on to the nose, epistaxis, one of my all-time favorite medical words because it sounds cool and usually it's pretty lame. Uh, epistaxis or nosebleed can occur spontaneously or a result of trauma. Um, in many cases, is, is as a result of trauma, either taking a blow to the nose or from digital trauma, because somebody stuck a digit up their nose. Um, a lot of times it's also from high blood pressure, hypertension, um, and then uh, nasal mucosa can get very dry, 
uh, from uh, the environment. So um, I myself have, have had a few uh, nosebleeds this, this time of year over the winter because of the extremely dry um, air. And then on top of that, I take a nasal steroid for my uh, uh, hay fever. And uh, that usually doesn't help the process either. So people can have some fairly significant bleeding. It's usually more significant when it's actually bleeding uh, as a posterior bleed where it's running down the back of their throat. Um, the best way to control this is to pinch the nostrils together firmly to control the bleeding and hold. You got to pinch directly below the bony part of the nose, as high up on the nose before you hit the bone as possible. Um, and pinch and hold. Um, have them lean forward, not lean their head backwards. And ask the patient to not swallow any blood. Try to spit it out if they have to. Swallowing the blood is just going to make them uh, nauseated. Uh, other things you can do is sometimes putting a little ice pack across the bridge of the nose can help. And putting a little pressure above the two top front teeth. Uh, so like rolling up a piece of gauze and putting it between the lip and the and the uh, the gums um, as far up, kind of up against the fren frenulum up there, and a little gentle pressure uh, to help uh, kind of constrict the blood vessels a little. Foreign bodies in the nose, pretty common again in the pediatric population. In most cases, we're not going to try to remove that. Uh, we don't know how far it goes in many cases, so uh, it could be down there pretty far, and we could could cause a pretty significant uh, injury. Sinusitis, uh, most of us get to deal with this from time to time. It's either from some sort of infection or most commonly from seasonal allergies where it causes us to have some inflammation in there. Um, usually causes um, excess of um, uh, histamine release and we you know, get the runny nose, the itchiness that can extend, uh, you know, can extend to other parts of our body too, giving us the watery eyes and maybe even uh, uh, some itchiness in our ears a little bit uh, and into our throat. It may cause us to have a little bit of a cough. In most cases, it's just excessive nasal discharge. Uh, so we're constantly running around blowing our nose. So it can also be lead to a headache if it gets into the sinuses uh, and starts to build up some pressure in there. Uh, that post-nasal drip where some of that mucus is running down the back of, of the, the throat it irritates that going to cause some halitosis or bad breath, and can even get bad and spread into the orbits and cause that orbocellulitis like I mentioned earlier. Epistaxis or nosebleed can be exacerbated by certain medications such as aspirin um, or, heparin, or uh, uh, warfarin, coumadin, uh, hypertension, and they may have other underlying medical problems, hemophilia uh, for example. The oral cavity, so pain in the tooth and jaw uh, can arise from a myocardial infarction to relatively serious or an ear infection or a sinus infection, which obviously is not. Um, so sometimes it's very tough to tell. If you're kind of questioning it, maybe start to think a little bit more against, uh, you know, this doesn't make sense why they immediately have this, um, you know, and, and they're complaining of, uh, of some atypical pain. Uh, some, maybe some atypical presentation. Maybe we should throw a 12 lead on them and check just to be safe. There are a number of painful dental problems, uh, cavities at tooth abscess, uh, which you, that generally leads you to get a, a root canal or a pulled tooth, one of the two. Cracked or broken teeth, gum disease. Um, there's lots of different things that, that can cause us to have uh, painful uh, mouth and dental problems. Of course, you can get infections and sores and whatnot. Uh, that abscess, that's an infection in the pulp cavity of the tooth, or you've basically gotten an infection inside the tooth itself. Usually it comes from a cavity, or what is referred to as dental caries. Um, and that's an erosion of, of the outer layers of the teeth, and it allows uh, the, uh, the inner parts of the teeth to, be, uh, to, to become infected, essentially. So we really have no specific pre-hospital treatment for dental pain. I suppose if you were a nice guy, you could give them a couple of uh, Tylenol or a couple of uh, Motrin, but for the most part, that's, that's the extent of what we're going to do for them. 
And we may also have things that are a little more serious uh, that affect the throat, such as epiglottitis. Uh, we talked about this in the uh, infectious disease chapter as well, as we'll, and we'll hit on it again in pediatrics. Uh, but it's caused by um, one of the uh, uh, flu bacteria and uh, Haemophilus influenzae B, Hib, um, was once pretty common in children. Now it's, it's mostly prevented by uh, childhood vaccination. However, there's a number of unvaccinated adults and children who have eventually come down with this. The biggest problem causes them to have some hydrophobia, which causes them to drool because uh, it's very painful for anything to roll down the back of their throat. Um, they typically will maybe have a little bit of strider and uh, some slight difficulty in breathing. Usually they went from being perfectly healthy, going to bed, maybe just feeling a little down, uh, to waking up and being very, very sick uh, with the shortness of breath. So keep your stuff out of their mouth. Peritonsular abscess its another potential threat, threat to the airway. So we have an infection uh, surrounding uh, the palatine tonsils. Uh, and it cause, uh, usually caused by either a strep or a staph bacteria. Um, these can get to be pretty pretty good size um, inflammations. It uh, can be some pretty terrific pain uh, throughout the throat as well as up into their ear. Um, and uh, they speak um, with a uh, hot potato voice, so as if they're holding hot food in their mouth. So you kind of get a really weird uh, sense of... Uh, of a voice from them. Um, and the swelling and the distortion is what's causing some of that uh, air uh, distortion as if they're trying to speak. Diphtheria. Uh, diphtheria, bacterial infection. It's fairly contagious. Uh, caused from uh, contact with the pseudomembrane or respiratory droplets uh, and is particularly infectious. Um, and it, it, adheres to the nasopharyngeal mucosa, and then it starts to excrete a toxin that destroys those tissues. Um, now, typically, it's controlled, uh, again, by vaccination, but people who aren't fully vaccinated or people who aren't vaccinated at all potentially have that. They're going to have signs of a, an upper respiratory infection. It's not going to be something you're going to be able to, to pick out in the field. All right, so in summary, we have disorders of the EENT. They can be painful and distressing. Uh, be aware that these problems can be life-threatening, but in most cases are not. Uh, they threaten our special senses, which is particularly distressing to many people. Um, and then uh, some of the things that are, are particularly concerned are those that are going to potentially obstruct our airway or lead to a septic uh, condition. The loss of sight, hearing, or vertigo uh, can have other causes, such as stroke or tumors, um, and use a focused approach uh, to your history and assessment. Provide reassurance to your patient, and then consider the need for IV fluids and analgesia on a as-needed basis.